read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance hit record bitch <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> I had to like shoo my dog out of my office because she's chewing on the bone. And now she's sitting outside of it. And I have like French doors so you can see through mm-hmm. them. It's so sad. Are we it's recording now? Like, welcome to Read Me Romance. Oh. <laughs> welcome as I talk about my dog. No big deal. <laughs> All right. So welcome. Wait, who we got? I was like we the weirdest uh, intro. <laughs> Do what? It was like the weirdest intro. We're like, we're here, maybe. <laughs> well, it's Abby Knox's week, so we can actually kind of chill. So it's kind of nice. We can. Yeah. I actually yeah. always feel less pressure when it's somebody we know. Like if it's yeah. us or like it's mm-hmm. Abby or Rochelle yeah, or something. Like I'm friends. like, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, they don't care if we fuck up. It's not yeah. like it's their job or their future or their livelihood. No big deal. <laughs> Do you know Abby rewrote her author bio? Did I tell you that? Yeah. Like she heard me read Matilda Martell's and she was like, fuck, I got to update. She's like, you're going to read my bio? So she sent me like the whole new thing. She sent me all this stuff on her. She's going to, you're going to love her giveaway this week. Did you see it? Did I, I, sent it I sent you 40 in the email. She's given away a $50 Ulta gift card. And she's also given away the Ulta Gilmore Girls night in gift set. That includes like under eye cooling balm, lip scrub, facial mist, universal balm, tinted lip oil. And it's all based on uh, Gilmore Girls. And she oh, said, there's I love a, that. And then she said, there's a Chilton Academy makeup pouch. She said, people will know what that is. I don't know what that is. What is Chilton Academy? I can't remember. God, it's been so long since I watched the Gilmore Girls, and I watched the whole thing through. So yeah, what is it like the school? Is it an academy? I would think it would be like the. Oh, school is that the something. fancy private school she went to? Oh, that must be it then. I never Did watched went- it. Yeah, I've always heard it's. You know, it's one of those things. Like maybe I just missed it. I don't know, but it sounds exactly like something I'd like. I, maybe I should just go back and watch it. Fuck it. Yeah, I've, it's I've been like- a long time. I've tried Shit's Creek a couple of times because people will constantly tell me like, oh, it's the best show. It's so great. And I have tried so many times to watch it. I think I'm up to like three times trying to watch it now. And I just was like, I, it sounds like it should be for me. But for some reason, it's just not it. I don't know why. I, I have enjoyed seeing other people watching it and then bringing things up. Like me remembering liking a certain hero like Mm -hmm. favoring somebody and then them calling it up and being like showing side by side to the bad boy hero yeah and the one who's supposed to be the good one and actually the bad boy one was more like liberal and supportive and (laughs) you're like holy shit you know what i mean like the bad boy one i think there was one relation people have probably seen it if they watch the show like the good old boy was like, I can't Gilmore believe Girl? you chose that college and you didn't even tell me. And the bad boy one was like, you dropped out of that? Are you fucking stupid? Like, <laughs> even though it was meaner, yeah, it was actually yeah. the more like yeah, supportive. Like better choice. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow. It's interesting to see when you were younger what you think is supposed uh-huh. to be a good guy. Yep. And then growing up and then mm-hmm. looking back, I'm like, that was fucked up. <laughs> yep. Yep. I know, right? Like the your definitely your priorities change as you get older and watch shows like that because you know it's it's actually a wonderful segue because I have a note on here to talk about never have I ever, and that was one I watched it when it had been the first season had been out for a long time. It's produced by Mindy Kaling, and it's about an Indian girl in high school, and it's very like drama and like, but it's funny. It's funny as shit. And this girl, her name's Davy. She is just really cool and quirky and nerdy, but also kind of a badass. Mm -hmm. And it's like her family dynamics and their Indian culture. And it's just, it's such a refreshing change on a high school dynamic. But there's kind of like this love triangle that happens. And there's like this hot swimmer jock guy that's like super sexy. And then there's like this nerdy guy that's kind of her enemy because they've been their entire lives. They've been competing to be number one. Because they're both like the smartest and the best and that kind of thing. And so it's like she falls for both of them in season one. And so then it's like kind of a love triangle. And now we're in season two. Just came out and I finally watched it. And it's already got a season three going. So, you know, 
it's interesting because I was actually talking to Kiwi Tyler the other day and she was like, oh my God, Paxton's so hot. Da, da, da. And I was like, I don't know. I kind of like Ben. Like, you know, he's still the nerdy. He's kind of a like jerk, so to speak. But like you say, he challenges her to be yep. the best. Like he pushes her to be the best version of herself. You know, she succeeds with him. Mm-hmm. And like with, with Paxton, she just doesn't, you know, like she's just having a good time and he's hot. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it cool, was just interesting yeah. when I seen it to look back, I was like, huh. Yeah. I would be interested to know like what someone in like their early twenties, what their thoughts are on that show you know, versus, I versus think they, me as an adult. So. I don't know. Gilmore Girls, it ended it perfectly. How did it end? Well, I'm sure it's spoiler, but people would know. Yeah. She picks herself. She doesn't pick a man at the end. Ooh, I like that. She picks, she graduates, and she goes, and she leaves the super rich hot guy or whatever, and mm-hmm. she goes and um, goes on the campaign trail with Obama. Oh, shit. That's cool. So, like, she's always been into politics and stuff. And at the end, she's like, I'm not picking any. I'm picking me. And so you're like, yes, girl. Like, she's about to start a new chapter on her life. And she's picking herself. And she's going. And I was like, that was fucking perfect. Oh, I love that. So who does she end up with, like, later? Is there, like, an epilogue? (laughs) Oh, I never watched. (laughs) I think that they did, like, years later. Uh Uh-huh. Like, a reunion show or whatever. I never watched it. I'd so, be interested to know, like, well, what, where's she at now? You know, like that kind of thing. Like, what's she up to now? I think that's so cool. Um, the other thing I have on our list to discuss is Britney's engaged. And I, I just, know. first of all, I'm upset that she didn't even think about going through our list. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like she didn't even, she didn't even glance at it. Like, we I put know. out the list and the next day. She was like, I'm engaged. I know, and I kind of wanted to bring Keanu Reeves to the table. He's with that older lady. Well, I say older. She's, like, age appropriate, and she's For him, I know. That's why I didn't at the same time. I know they're not married. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, you haven't put a ring on it. So sometimes I'm like, fair game, dude. He's been with a woman forever, Keanu Reeves. Yes. I know. know, But my apprehension with Brittany about this guy, like, she's finally free. I just care for him. I know. Why is she running to why is why is she hurrying to this? Like maybe she couldn't do it while she was under her conservatorship. Like maybe she wasn't allowed to get married and now she's I don't think she was. I think he's been holding back and they've been playing by the rules. And I'm sure that there's I also believe that with as as tight lipped as she's been, that she was scared to be sued by her own company. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So she's been very quiet. I don't know. I just feel like she is finally free of this conservatorship. Yes, she can do whatever whatever she wants. Obviously, marry her man. But, girl, you're like two days out. (laughs) But then she may think, you know, maybe I'm all wrong about him. I hope I am. I really, really hope I am completely wrong about him. Mm -hmm. And... You know, it's great. And maybe she's like, he stood by me. He's went through this with me. And, you know, I I saw today on one of her posts, like she's like posting, I mean, close to nudes and stuff like that, which I mean, I'm just, I'm so excited that that's what she's doing because Mm -hmm. I'm just like, fuck yeah. If you want to take all your clothes off and say, kiss my ass, do it. And that's literally what she's doing. She's taking all her clothes off and being like, kiss my fucking ass she's it's like here's my, skin on my ass here it is <laughs> and my husband's like yes i was that's exactly <laughs> i was mentally asking for that <laughs> yep yep you know if we had to go through 2020 to get to this i mean it was worth it <laughs> for Brittany to be living her best life she's doing so great Oh, God. Um, so my husband's been gone since last week and he came home just a minute ago actually but um you know, I have he. I, I figured out a couple of things while he was gone for a week. My day to day life didn't change. There was nothing more I had to do, nope. and nothing less I had to do. I'm not shocked. I'm not fucking shocked either. It's it's the same I'm way bitter. when men go out of town. When yeah. men go out of town, they just go. Yeah. Before I go out of town, I'm like lining shit up and working things out, going to the store, making sure the house is clean for them. Leaving menus, instructions on where the food is. This kid needs to go here. 
this you got to pack lunch on this day is because they're serving this food and they don't like it make sure they got their water bottles like masks uh, yeah. i mean just between laundry baths bedtime dinner like school work i didn't even know he was gone <laughs> a whole fucking week and i got really mad about that yesterday actually because i was cleaning up the house for like the cleaners came today or whatever because i was like you know what i'm just gonna like have the house clean and everything it'll be nice like before he gets back and i was like picking up and putting stuff away and do and i was just like so angry for a little while because i was just like oh wow this is it like there's there's just no difference and then I was like, that's, you know, kind of shitty. Like, he does take out the garbage sometimes. That, that sort of annoyed me. <laughs> I, would like, I would like to say this, though, that we kind of do it to ourselves. Oh, 100%. We don't sure we put more 100%. on their plate. They would handle it. But we yes. just don't. We're not built that way. No. No, I have enabled this behavior mm -hmm. for sure. I have dug my own grave, and I'm living in it. I yeah. built a house in here. Like, this is where we're at. Yeah. So I've definitely enabled this behavior because, I mean, he's so great about that. Like, if I ask him to do something, he'll totally do it. So like, it's not that, that that's the problem. But I think that's what made me so mad was I'm like, why am I like this? Why did yeah. I do this to myself? How have I gone a whole week and haven't really noticed anything different? Like, this really sucks. It shouldn't be like this. Yeah. So I don't I mean, know it's how. it's not 100% like, our fault. I think society built us this way and we're still trying to shake off some of that shit. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. But. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, it, yeah. You know, that also leads me into LuLaRoe. So. I, this, I have been, I'm mildly impressed at the same time as annoyed and angry. <laughs> so this, uh, the reason I like thought about it even right now when we were talking about it because like the gender roles and traditional roles in the home and husbands and wives and things like that so LuLaRoe obviously if you're listening you know what that is like it's leggings they sold it was a company it was multi-level marketing and every I, I think every person knows someone that sold it mm -hmm. I, I just think that's a fact <laughs> because so many people sold it I've but, never owned a pair I owned one pair. I did. They had a girl in town here. Um, it was right after we joined Girl Scouts. She was selling her inventory. It was kind of like on the decline mm -hmm. when things got pretty bad. And so she was trying to make some money off of her inventory. So she had a big sale in one of the rooms in our Girl Scout meeting. And you could go in and she donated all the money she made to Girl Scouts. So it got other moms and stuff to come in and buy it. So I bought the I bought Lydia like a dress and a pair of leggings. They had a ton of kids stuff. Mm -hmm. So I bought like a couple of kids stuff and they loved them. Like the girls loved their stuff. I bought a pair of leggings, one pair, and I wore them probably about four hours before I had to take them off. Really? I thought they were supposed to be really soft. They are super soft, really, really stretchy, comfortable. Like I'm gonna you, wonder if this is the problem. I'm gonna Go ahead and tell me what you didn't like about them. I'm going to see if it's what I, why I didn't buy them. They won't stay up. That is why I never buy them. When I bought them and I see, mm -hmm. or I didn't buy them, when I seen mm -hmm. them and I felt them, I was mm -hmm. like, these aren't true leggings. No. The point of a legging is to feel like it's really tight on you. It actually makes you feel a little bit skinnier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes like you go put together in. and tight. Just like and cinch it in real good. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. those did not give me that feeling. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is a little bit too comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I remember, do you remember when I bought those good American jeans and they were like 150 yeah. bucks? Yeah. I bought three different pair, bought them three different times. I ordered a pair, tried them on, sent them back, ordered a different pair, tried them on, sent them back, or a different pair, tried them on, sent them back. Every single pair of good American jeans I tried on, I have a huge ass. I have a big ass. My waist is a little bit smaller than it, not much, but I have, but I also have really big thighs and those jeans were perfect to fit my butt, but I, it was like, I could not get them to work on my thighs. Like they mm -hmm. wouldn't go all the way up to like go over my, it's made for someone with skinny legs and a huge ass, which are the Kardashians, I guess. But that's what I felt like kind of happened with LuLaRoe was that 
I need something that goes over my ass and holds tight so that it doesn't yeah. fall down. And these just kind of went over it. And so, I want like, that even when I'm just pulling been tiny, I'm like, I need it to fit. Yeah. Yeah. To stick to me. <laughs> well, and I could see like these were, I thought of them more like tights than leggings. Like, okay, that these are go under a dress. Like, I wouldn't wear these just by themselves. Like, you know, with a pair of like Fabletics or whatever, I would wear those on their own with a t shirt. With those, yeah. I would have never done that. They just weren't that thick material that I'm like, would want everybody looking at my butt, you know, wearing them. Anyway, so that was the one pair I owned, and but I remember I had a friend. Um, it was my my friend's wife, and her friend. It was five thousand dollars to join Lularoe at the time, and they went in together. They both paid twenty five hundred dollars to start their shop, and so, and this was, and again, this was on the decline. Like this was in like two thousand seventeen. It was like when shit was already going down with them, uh -huh. and so I remember like her husband, one of their husbands kept adding me to their group, their Facebook group. And I kept getting out and they kept like and pulling me back in because like back in the day on Facebook, you know how you could just add people to groups, yeah. you know, without them, without them consenting to it. And so I was just like, I, I don't like these, like, this is not my thing. And I just was watching this documentary and I was thinking about her the whole time because both mm -hmm. of these women had young children. They could not afford this. They scraped up all the money they could to do this thinking, you know, this was the, this was obviously the next thing that they had to do. You know, they were going to make money off this, like blah, blah, blah. And I, they just, I mean, as soon as they opened, they closed. I mean, when I'm watching this documentary, which you guys should definitely watch. It's on I'm Amazon. Like, it's I'm free. Like, oh my God. But like, one of my it's first only thoughts episodes. was like, one of my first thoughts terribly was like, me and Leah could have killed at this if we got on early. I am not even joking. I had <laughs> It was like if me and Leah had been oh, on this, we oh, would have been like the top game over. tier. I would have been making graphics. Mentor. She would have been on Instagram. I would have been mentor day two. I feel like God, that's I was it. Like, we would have had. I would have we been behind have the scenes. <laughs> we would have been front of the scenes, and we would have owned this shit. <laughs> oh but, my um, god, that would have. That's so. I thought about that. I was like, I would have been really good at that if I liked their leggings. <laughs> but um. <laughs> I was, I thought it's such, it was such a brilliant idea because it is, when I was watching them do this, I was like, that statistically the millennials are the most educated generation ever. And they mm -hmm. might actually be the most educated generation ever. Cause now mm -hmm. people aren't saying, you know, everybody go to college, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have all these millennials who are very educated and a mm -hmm. huge chunk who have gone to college and then decided to stay home and raise their kids. Mm -hmm. So you have brilliant driven women at mm -hmm. home that you can use mm -hmm. they know what they're doing they know how to market they're good with technology it was like this was like the perfect person or group to go after mm -hmm. and that's how it did so well i think at least yeah i mean i could definitely the see how that they feel to that sucked in were like the perfect generation of people to get i, I could totally see that yeah 100 percent you know, so this it's only four episodes and they're like 45 minutes long, but there is a lot packed into these four episodes. Yeah, I'm only two in. I just started the third and then it's mm -hmm. getting into like, this is kind of a cult. And I'm like, yeah. it's kind of a cult. <laughs> oh, it for sure is. And, you know, I didn't realize that the founders of it were in the Mormon church. And as soon as they said that, I was like, this all makes sense now. I knew before they even said <laughs> it, when she was like, I had seven, seven kids. children. And I was like, oh, she must be Mormon. Like, that's terrible. Like, he I had was seven like, kids. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, that's a lot of kids. And he had this many. And we married and we adopted. I was like, okay, this is a huge family. This has got to be generally. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be something. There's a cult. <laughs> There's a cult happening. But, you know, I've talked about it on the podcast for it's long back. It was several, maybe even a, two years ago. But I talked about the Dream Podcast. And the whole podcast was about multi-level marketing. And this woman that she's an investigative reporter that went into an MLM Mm -hmm. And so that she could report about her experience. And so from that, she ended up looking into all these different MLMs and how like a huge, like the major market is in Utah. That's where they come out of. Like that's where most of these businesses are made and how most of them are designed around the Mormon church. And it was just like, what the fuck? Like, 
because like it 31, is 31 the bags you remember those like the bags yes. get, like those were from the mormons or like, that was a mormon church thing like but uh, just the what's the, it works that was another one too it works it's still going but just watching oh, this God. i can see how everybody got sucked into it yeah like Ooh. i can i get it i even mm -hmm. now watching it as terrible as it sounds i'm like i think i could still get into this and make money if i as long as you're willing to work the hardest yeah yeah for sure because if you're yeah. willing to work the hardest you have to be if you get into something like this you have to think that you're in the top 10 hard worker percent of the hard workers of this company or you're not going to make it I think which the, they make you think that you don't have to work yeah is there no, they pretend they're like you mm -hmm. work part-time and make full-time mm -hmm. when that's not the truth sure. well and i one of the things that i really like took away from it was just how they made it seem their products were wanted i think that's yeah. the thing i took away from it was like it didn't appear as an mlm even though it was set up that way it didn't appear that way because people actually wanted this product i've never seen an mlm where the product was actually this desirable yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've I, never seen anything like that where it's like, what? Well, at first, when I first, when you st first started watching it, I'm like, they didn't do anything wrong. Like, when you first start, yeah. you're like, okay, this works. People want this. But then when they looped around to the next episode and they're like, the you had to buy in, I was like, mm -hmm. here we go. <laughs> and then they got bonuses paid on recruitment instead yeah, of on I sales. See. That's how they base their bonuses. And I'm like, any company that's paying you $20,000 a month for recruiting people, like that's some, that's, there's something really, I don't know. It seems like, it seems seedy. Like, I don't know. It feels dirty. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. And, but it was just so sad, the women that were interviewed in this, but also really fascinating. I don't know why I am so fascinated by LuLaRoe and this whole thing. And maybe it's because I can totally put myself yep. in that position where I would have done this. I would, I a hundred percent too. Had I tried on this product and loved it, there would have been no stopping. Like I'd have Because been not, for no, not for nothing, not that the book world is anything like this, but that like chairmanship that they have going on oh, yeah. reminds uh -huh. me a lot of book signings and the book world and the whole like yep. that mm -hmm. flashiness. Yep. I'm like, this kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Oh, yeah. Bit. Oh, yeah. I can I could definitely see some parallels, like the conventions and stuff, the that sort of thing. Even to an extent, like the way they do their like Facebook lives and like mm -hmm. their sales and stuff. Like, you know, there are so many similarities between women who sell books, like authors who write romance and sell their books and people who own their own LuLaRoe shop and sell their items. Like yeah. there are a ton of similarities in that. And maybe that's why I'm so fascinated with it. And I can identify with these women that are on it. There yeah. was the one woman who was like really vocal about it. She had been in another um, a documentary from, put on by Vice and that one's on like YouTube. And it's like, I think it's like maybe an hour long and you can watch that. And she goes really in depth about uh, afterwards. Um, she actually set up like this MLM thing where it's not like a charity, but it's like she basically set up a foundation to help people get out of MLMs or to like recoup some of their stuff or whatever, like to sort of help them through where they're at when this, once they get out. And so I thought that was really cool because I found her on TikTok actually, when I went and looked it up, I was looking up this person and I can't remember what her name was now. I had to find it. But um, I went and looked it up just to see like, well, where is she now? Like what's happening? And she said a lot of that was cut out. She said, this is only four episodes. She was like, there were hours and hours. She said that interview with the two people, the founders or whatever, she said that interview was like eight hours long. And she said they, the couple said that they got up and walked out halfway through it. And she was like, they did not. She said they were the first ones that were interviewed out of everybody else so that they didn't know who else was going to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. They were like, the documentary people did that on purpose yeah. because they didn't want what they were saying skewed based on who they knew was going to go after them or yeah. who else was saying what. So I thought that was actually pretty smart on their part. But they said their interview, I think it was like six or eight hours, but she said it on there. But um, it was just like, I don't know. I, it, 
I can't stop watching it. Like, I, I, I but what drove me nuts is how the the woman is all like, "This is my business. I started this." Da da da. And then her husband keeps mansplaining her. <laughs> yes. Oh, when he asked, when the documentary guy was like, "Can you tell us like what how you did this for women and blah blah blah," and, and like the guy just went to was like. Let me answer that first. And I was just like, what the fuck? Dude. I know. I like died. Uh, so this woman's name, I looked it up. It's Berta like, whoa, B-E-R-T-A like W-H-O-A. Whoa. Um, she was that. It says on her bio on TikTok that one girl from that one thing, anti-MLM. Is she the one that went into Lulu like trying to investigate them? No, because mm -mm, there's one no. girl that like she literally went into Lulu to investigate. Like she was like, I got obsessed Ooh. with them on the documentary. Like oh, the the skinny one with the brown hair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She wasn't in it. She never got. She never sold it or anything. She was just obsessed with it. Okay. She said it was like she's like really into numbers and stuff. And mm -hmm. so I guess one thing she saw the tax like, got her. That would get me too. Yes. I'd be like, why is that tax so low? This is bullshit. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, yeah. When she was at a party or something, and she saw what how much they were paying in tax on their forms, and she was like, "That's not right." Mm -hmm. Like she's su she's super super smart, and so she just kept following it, and then she kept following the lawsuits and stuff. I mean, it's just a really fascinating thing in general. the The whole system of this, but the fact that so many women were not like duped. I don't want to say that because it's not like they were tricked into this, but they were used. They were manipulated. They were used. They were, used, they were lied to, yep. you know, and a lot of people they lost were, a fuck some, ton of money. I mean, I've just started the third episode. They were trapped at one point. Like yeah, they started yeah. trapping some of these women, like, holy mm -hmm. shit. I was like, yeah. they did not pulling them to meetings, making them bring their husbands. I was like, oh my God, this is getting bad. Yeah. Oh, it gets way worse, especially with the husbands and stuff where it was like their whole mindset was like, we want you to build this business and then bring your husband in and let him run things. That was what that that's what the couple wants to happen. Yeah. You know, like it's just it's so disgusting, like that sort of uh, the toxicness anyways. But I think the reason that, you know, I that I wanted to watch it and I wanted to talk about it was because we all know someone that sold it. So I bet you anything, we all know someone who was used by this. Or somebody are, who's doing that. It works right now. Yeah. Might want to check this out. <laughs> yep. Because it's like, I mean, it just sucks because like, I don't know. Like these no, are they our went friends, after these, our sisters, our yeah, moms. Like they went after this generation. These I feel mm -hmm. like they went after this generation of educated women and told them they could do something. And even I, looking at the beginning, I'm like, okay, I see how this is work. They can mm -hmm. do this, but then they just let too many people. If you get too mm -hmm. many people, you flood the market. It's too much. It's saturating. I even wondered after it was over. I wondered if they would get more recruitment now. After the documentary, I wondered, or so far I'm wondering, I was like, if they would have slowed down and capped mm -hmm. it, like this is all mm -hmm. the retailers that we can have, yeah. that they would, it would have been okay. This would, and if yeah. one dropped out, a new one could come in. It might have yeah. worked, mm -hmm. but it went well, too far. And something they'll talk about, I think it's in one of the last episodes, is they talk about the buyback incentive. They used to not have any return policy whatsoever. And after a while, they offered a 100% buyback. So if you wanted to sign up for LuLaRoe and then you changed your mind, they would buy back 100% of your inventory for what they paid for the, for what you paid for it. They would buy yeah. that back. They had that guarantee for like a month because they had all of a sudden, they had hundreds of women jumping out. Mm-hmm. You're trying to get their money. And one of the girls said that she said, I had $20,000 in inventory and I submitted like my refund to get out like in the right time. And they approved it. And she was like, and then they wanted to like drag their feet and deny it. So she had to get a lawyer. She had to go through litigation and they settled outside of court. And so like, that was something that really shocked me too, was that the amount of people, once they had that, the amount of people were like, I got to get the fuck out of this. Yeah. You know, because it was just like, you know, you have tens of thousands of dollars in inventory and you're forced to buy more every month because you have to keep up with either the new stuff, the limited stuff, or like, you know, you have to buy so much every month or sell so much every month. 
It's not. God, it's just insanity. But if you haven't watched it, you should. It's it's really eye opening, and I honestly feel like it gives a lot of compassion to people who get caught up in this because mm-hmm. it's easy to be like, "Come on, friend was so stupid. Like, I can't believe she did that or whatever." You know, she but, she sold that stuff or whatever. But just like I said, though, it's these women at home that used to be in the business world, and then they're at home and they're just doing kids, and they're like, "Oh, I can contribute. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm yeah, a part of help. this group. You mm-hmm. know, we're working together. We're you know, that's so uplifting until it's not." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Socks. I know. Well, let's talk about Abby. She probably (laughs) loves this episode because she's fascinated about this shit too. So (laughs) she's probably like, this is awesome. All right. So Abby Knox has brought us this week a book. It's called Roadside Attraction. And it's amazing. It's so cute. I I just love her to death. And so um, this book is the one that has the dog, the golden retriever, who's a mayor of the yes. town and like the the grumpy like tow truck guy in town like he's his owner and he has to take him to all these events because the mayor has to be present for like ribbon cuttings and all this bullshit so like and he's mad that he has to like go all over town and do it so it's so fucking cute and um she told me if anybody likes parks and rec this is very like it, it's very much similar to that where it's Some like rom-com the, definitely hardcore. yeah well and it's like the competing towns too was another one because mm-hmm. it was like um hold on she had it on here and i wanted to make sure i said it right she says definitely has a pawnee slash eagleton vibe and she's an also have to tell you that eagle said that flash i guess that's the name of the dog is 2021's little sebastian and that's from little sebastian's from parks and rec and she said but you know do not talk about eagle on the show anymore because she's busy <laughs> she said we have to stop talking about eagle being an editor on the podcast so i'll read you abby knox's bio and then we'll tell you again about her giveaway and i'll read you the book bio for what you're about to hear so abby knox writes feel good high heat romances that she herself would want to read Her readers have been known to describe her stories as quirky, sexy, adorable, and hilarious. All of that adds up to Abby's all-encompassing goal in life, to be kind and have fun. Abby's world, you won't find, in Abby's world, you won't find bullies, alpha holes, or dark romances. No judgment if that's your thing. No kink shame in this world. Even when she tries to go darker or grittier, readers still seem to find the sweet side. So there's no escaping it for her. Some of her favorite tropes you'll see across Abby's catalog are force proximity, opposites attract, grumpy, sunshine, age gap, boss employee, faded mates, and still love and more. You'll meet quite a few billionaires, and most of her heroes prefer flannel over suits and ties. Virgin and plus size main characters, both male and female, Ooh. show up from time to time, but Abby's love for interesting characters is never limited to any one body type or sexual history. No doubt you'll always notice Abby is heavily influenced by Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Gilmore Girls, and Lost. But don't worry, she won't ever make you suffer like Luke and Lorelai. <laughs> if any or all of that connects with you, then you came to the right place. That's a great book. Bi- that's a great author bio. That's it is. Friend. Yeah, I know everything I need to know in that. So, like I said, this week she is giving away a $50 Ulta gift card, an exclusive Ulta Gilmore Girls night in gift set. A Chilton Academy makeup pouch and blue plaid. And I told you about what the Gilmore set had. All right. So she has book two in this, in the Roadside Attraction series. Um, It's called Claiming Fate. It's out now. Um, She said, if listeners want to know about book two, then in the epilogue of the book you're listening to now, it has a little intro into Izzy and Danny from book two. So... (laughs) If you're listening to the book this week and you want to grab the ebook, get the epilogues, all that good stuff, you get an intro into book two. So that's on there. And then she has all these great links to all her stuff. She also said, check out her merch page. If you're a lover of her book, she's got like swag and sign books and all that stuff on her website. And we'll put all these links in the show notes. Um, she also said Paradise Passion Series. Um, she said right now it's a duet, but there's more. Um, the first one is Baby Moon. And she said this is a heroine. A heroine wants to be artificially inseminated. And guess who's down for the job instead? <laughs> she said and the second book is called Honeymoon Hideout, where there's a runaway bride and she falls for a nervy um, conservationist. So I thought that was kind of cute. Um, Homemade Heat is um, that's a five sisters 
five age, age gap stories all about baking and chefs. And the one that's called Judge Me was inspired by the Great British Bake Off. And it has like a, a Paul Hole or Paul Hollywood um, like daddy vibe in it. Like it's so hot. So it, there's a new season of Great British Baking Show about to happen. So it's perfect time to read those. <laughs> All right, um, you're about to hear Roadside Attraction. Um, oh, let me give you the bio for that. After escaping a bad situation, Juniper is out on the run. A little car trouble is to be expected on her cross-country road trip to nowhere in particular. But breaking down and being stuck in a strange little town called Fate was not in the plan. Neither was meeting a surly tow truck driver slash mechanic who arrives just in time. Rex is Broody, bossy, and strong, and the connection between them is insatious. Putting down roots in fate might seem simple, but it's only a matter of time before Juniper's complicated past catches up to her and brings her brings with it a whole tangled mess of trouble. Sounds so cute. Let's play the first half. Let's do it. We'll see you on the other side. Bye. This is Roadside Attraction by Abby Knox. Read for you by Ramona Master. Chapter 1 Juniper Someone driving my dead husband's Cadillac has been following me across several state lines. My fingerprints may now be permanently imprinted in the steering wheel. But this morning I feel a little better. Hopped up on more caffeine pills than a cross-country trucker, I drove all night on two-lane roads through cornfield country. Checking my rearview mirror, I see no sign of the black Cadillac with an orange flame job on the hood. Whoever is tailing me wasn't prepared for an all-nighter. Never underestimate the will of a woman who's suddenly free of her bullying husband. I watched Roy's lifeless body hit the dirt. Seconds later, I was stuffing Roy's revolver and ammo in my purse and driving as fast as my Civic would go. Let his idiot brother bury him. I could stay and wait for the life insurance to shake out, but on the other hand, I don't want it. From dust we rise and to dust we shall return. And I'm shaking all that dust from Roy and that Nebraska town off of me. The car that's been chasing me down belongs to my dead husband. And it's the only thing Roy ever loved. I cross the Ohio River at dawn and recheck my mirror. All clear. I can breathe. Maybe I can even eat something. I eye the billboards along the road for some place to stretch my legs and fill my empty belly. Historic fate, exit two miles. See the amazing curiosity, spot of fate. Ruby's Diner, home of the world's best cherry pie. Ruby's sounds like my kind of place. Proud of myself for making good time, I decide I'll take that exit and order the most enormous omelet known to mankind. Ain't it just the way life goes then, that the check engine light flashes? At the same time, the car begins rattling and then knocking and then sputtering. You couldn't wait to break down until we reached civilization, could you? I ask. She answers me with a resentful hiss. And here we are, stuck on the side of the highway. Current status? Stranded on the edge of somewhere I've never been, between cornfield country and Appalachia. Popping the hood, I try to identify the issue. I've gleaned enough car knowledge from Roy that I could diagnose the problem, provided it's an easy fix. Installing a battery, adjusting air pressure, changing a flat tire, I can handle all of that. Even change the oil in a pinch. Yet she reveals no secrets to me. Checking the road, I go back to grab my phone off the passenger seat to search for a local mechanic. I dial the first number to pop up on my screen. Rex's Rex and Service. The phone rings once, twice, three times. No answer. Somebody, please pick up. I leave the hood propped open and walk east along the shoulder toward the exit for fate. Redialing. I quickly realize the walk to the exit is going to be a hot one. I double back to grab my water bottle, praying that I won't get too sunburned before finding help. As soon as I turn around, I realize that sunburn is the least of my worries. 
The painful knots return to my stomach as I spy the last thing I want to see in the entire world. Roy's black Cadillac has caught up to me. Then again, maybe not. The car is still far enough away that my eyes could be playing tricks on me. But why take that chance? I redial as I'd nab my water bottle. The black car closes in, and I realize I'm exposed. Do I run, hoping to flag down another motorist? Or do I stand here and prepare to point a loaded revolver at a human being? I look over my shoulder at another billboard. Find your fate, one more mile. I look back at the black car, now less than a quarter mile away and slowing down. My heart pounds in my throat. Time to make a choice. I reach my hand into my bag and touch the cool metal of the 38. At the same time, my ears prick at a new noise. A third vehicle has entered the scene, its tires grinding over the grit of the highway's shoulder behind me. A good Samaritan, maybe? A slam of a truck door. Heavy boots on gravel. Roy made those same noises on our driveway every night when he came home drunk and pissed about life. I remind myself, it's not Roy coming up behind you. Roy's worm food. So what's it gonna be, Juniper? Point the gun or surrender to the unknown? Chapter two. Rex. This emergency city council meeting is pointless. Town matriarch Ernestine Jenkins requested this meeting to address the matter of our town's marketing fund. Fate no longer has the revenue to maintain multiple billboards, so we need to decide what stays and what goes. The problem is this generation, Ernestine blusters. They're just not curious to stop at roadside attractions anymore. They use the Google to make decisions for them. Personally, I could not care less. Just pick one, so I can go back to work, I grumble. I'm not built to lead. I hate meetings and email. I just want to fix cars and watch the sunset on my back porch with my dog. Maybe set up a dating profile on the internet. I'm not terrible in the looks department, though I know my personality could use some tinkering. Even if I did meet someone nice online, I can't imagine anyone wanting to move here. Fate? Not exactly teeming with job opportunities or amenities. Well, hold on a minute. Oh, God. There's no end in sight to this discussion as soon as our at-large council person, Becky Flutter, weighs in. We should make a pro-con list for each billboard. Ruby catches me scrubbing my face in frustration, smirks, and walks away. Have fun, she mouths, headed back to the kitchen to put some distance between herself and these kooks. Now, I love all these kooks. I graduated high school with Becky Flutter, and I play pickup basketball with Danny Bryce every weekend. And dog bless them all for electing Flash a golden retriever as mayor by a landslide of write-in votes. Although Flash does great with shaking hands and kissing babies, he can neither call nor adjourn meetings. So his more tedious tasks, like interrupting a workday to watch adults panic en masse, fall to me. But sometimes. Sometimes I wish for someone on the outside to tell me what to do to help my tiny town. In a population of 500, we've got 499 opinions. The only person without opinions is Flash. His thoughts center around which neighbors give the best treats. Like the voice of God, Sheriff Mooney drowns out everyone when he radios me from his patrol. Marquette, you copy? I scramble for the button. Copy, what you got for me, Mooney? Stranded motorist! northbound on the state highway. I'm halfway out the door when Danny calls after me. You need to call a vote to adjourn first. Also, we haven't talked about my idea for the Guinness Book of World Records. 
a stickler for procedure. He hates it when I up and leave these pointless meetings. But I smile and wave goodbye. Also, I don't want to listen to another cockamamie idea. Won't be the first time I get his undies in a bunch, won't be the last. Chapter 3 Juniper Whoever is driving Roy's Cadillac has a sick sense of humor. I aim the 38. I ain't gonna fire unless I have to, but this jackass needs to know he doesn't scare me. Even though I'm so scared I don't remember my own name. I'm also so focused I barely hear the stranger shout as he comes up behind me. Whoa, what's happening? As the car with the familiar tacky orange flame job rolls by, the driver slows and rolls down the window. I inhale, cock the gun, and wait. Time moves like molasses. And then I hear it. The music blaring from those custom speakers is my wedding song. He may not have a weapon, but this character knows how to fuck with me. Once it passes us by, the caddy's tires squeal as the driver floors it down the highway. I decock the revolver when the car disappears on the horizon. I got a good look at the driver, and he bears a striking resemblance to a dead man. Ma'am. I assess the stranger with the truck. His oil-stained shirt and beaten leather work gloves make me jerk back on instinct. Without thinking, I point the gun at the man, my hands shaking. My mind must be playing tricks on me because now I'm seeing Roy everywhere. The gloved hands raise in surrender, but his expression is calm as he closes in on me. And then, the gloves come off. One large, rough hand reaches out and covers mine as I grip the gun's handle. The skin-on-skin -skin contact wakes up every hair follicle on my body. My senses kick into overdrive as he backs me against my car and grips both my wrists in one hand. I resist, and the stranger quickly pins my wrists against the dead Civic's roof. The passenger door handle dings into my lower back, and I grunt in frustration. This stranger's body surrounds me, and my nostrils fill with the scent of motor oil. I squirm against him, and every movement heightens my body's awareness. I writhe under him, gritting my teeth. Let me go. He backs up slightly, but I'm still trapped. His breath on my neck sends waves of arousal across my skin. And I don't know if it's the fearful kind of arousal or the fun kind. Either way, I kick out blindly, my knee acting on its own. He jerks sideways, my knee missing his groin. The stranger's torso traps me against the car. He aims to keep me here until I have no fight left. Bad news for him, I got plenty more. Especially if he thinks he's gonna get any relief for that steel pole in his jeans that's wedged against my pelvic bone. In the heat of the moment, senseless words tumble out of me. I ain't going back there. You can't keep me there against my will. His eyebrows draw together in confusion. Lady, I don't know who you think I am, but I ain't him. The man's close, deep voice and brown eyes wake me out of my momentary stupor. This isn't Roy. This man came to help me, and I aimed a gun at him. What am I doing? I relax my body, loosening my grip on the gun. We both hear it clank against the Honda's roof, and he lets me up. I swallow, my throat so dry it hurts, and say, I didn't mean to scare you. He eyes me as he hands me back the gun. Likewise. I wouldn't have shot you. We gaze at each other for a few seconds, and he speaks again. Get on in my truck. I'll give you a ride. My adrenaline still pumping, I lick the salty sweat off my lips. This is not the time or place to gather innuendo. I'm confusing fear for arousal. The more I try to paint over the image of this big fella giving me that kind of ride, the more I see it. I could climb up those dusty jeans and... Pull yourself together, Juniper Rollins. No sense jumping from one mess into another. You don't even know if he's safe. Ma'am. His wrinkled brow tells me what I seem like to him. I'm in an Ikea chair short of a few screws. I could fall apart at any moment. That's a strong possibility. Yeah, truck, thanks. 
Monosyllables are about all I can muster. He turns away, but I catch him looking, a quick up and down glance over me. Maybe he's checking for injuries or making sure I'm not going to draw my gun again. But I don't think so. No. I know that look. For the first time in a long time, I don't mind it at all. The second he opens the passenger door, a large furry dog lifts its head from the seat, taking me in with eyes just as soulful as those of our driver. Well, hello. The angelic canine face calms my anxiety about 10 notches, just as the tow truck driver grabs my waist from behind. I let out a small yip, not expecting hands lifting me off my feet. If this were a date, I'd tell him I don't need someone to help me climb in. I suspect none of that matters to him, though. He buckles my seatbelt and slams the door before I can open my mouth. I have no choice in the matter, so I might as well relax. And there's nothing like a great big chilled out dog plopping his head in my lap to unspool what remains of my stress. Chapter Four Rex. You Rex? The Honda owner asks when I park behind the service garage. Yep. You got a name? She hesitates. She's definitely in some kind of trouble. Flash nudges her hand, which has briefly stopped scratching him behind his ears. Her lip curves up warily, but she gives the dog what he wants. More scratches. She meets my gaze with haunted eyes and says, I dialed you seven times and no one answered. Sorry, I was out of the office. Hire help then. Okay. You still haven't told me your name. By the challenging look on her face, she ain't done asking questions. How did you know I was out there? Do you patrol the highways like some superhero? I rub my calloused hand over my chin. My mom used to say something about looking a gift horse in the mouth. She clicks her tongue and Flash adjusts his head in her lap. A horse is a terrible gift for someone with no barn and no pasture. I have questions. Sheriff saw you from the overpass. So why didn't the sheriff come to get me himself? I think about what I know of Sheriff Mooney. He has been trying to get me married for well over a decade. He's been known to call me to traffic stops if he thinks a female motorist might be my type. During last summer's baseball tournament, he set up barricades and detours to keep the parents from other towns driving in circles so they couldn't leave fate. This plan did result in parents stopping to ask me for directions. As he forgot to inform me to keep my eyes peeled for single moms, his scheme went over my head. Why? You weren't in any danger, and I'm the only soul within 39 miles with a tow truck. She squints at me, her knuckles rubbing over Flash's flanks. Her fingers curl through Flash's fur, and I sense the temperature drop in the truck cab. Name's Juniper Rollins. Thanks for the ride. But I suggest you forget you heard me say my name as soon as you fix me up. She exits before I can respond. Flash follows her out the door like a big old traitor. I say nothing but hop out to unhitch her car while watching her out of the corner of my eye. She crosses her arms, which pushes out her smallish breasts. I snap my eyes back to my work. Before I can stop myself from speaking a cheesy line out loud, I say it. Tough to forget. I pop the hood and take a look around. I've worked on a hundred civics in my day. They don't usually break down. My name? Yeah, I get that a lot. I smirk as I slam the hood back down. No. I meant you. Nothing special to know about me. She looks back at me defiantly, but her body language tells a different story. She darts her eyes around, gnaws on her lips, brushes her hair back from her face. Juniper can try to sell me that defiant, scrappy attitude, but I can see that she's tired and hungry. Go on next door and get yourself some food. Ruby will put it on my tab. She softens at the mention of food. I appreciate that, but I prefer to stay here with you in case 
I try to sound casual, but there's nothing casual in the subject matter. In case he comes back. Juniper glances at me. Her anger and grit have fallen away. All I see is a sweet soul alone. She nods. I want to ditch the car and take her home with me. Hide her and keep her safe. But that might not be the most desirable scenario for this particular person. Suit yourself. I nod toward the small dingy waiting room that's visible from the garage, indicating she should wait in there. Holler if you need me. Chapter 5 Juniper The floor-to-ceiling windows could use some Windex. That's the first thing I notice about this sorry excuse for a repair shop waiting room. The next thing is that the only magazines are car parts catalogs. My mind tabulates a list of everything I would do to make this space more inviting if it were mine. But maybe that's the point. Rex doesn't want people hanging around watching him while he fixes cars. Too bad, because he is something to watch. I don't care if this Rex character can see me staring. Behind me, flash barks. I turn and see his fringed tail wagging at a woman approaching the repair shop, her arms laden with bags and cup carriers. I rush over to hold open the door for her. With no introduction, she says, Rex didn't know what you wanted, so I brought a selection. I take the drink carrier from her, and she walks to the register counter to set down the rest, then hands me a takeout box. The aroma of food, real food, not gas station hot dogs, makes my stomach roar and my mouth salivate. That there is eggs, pancakes, and bacon, and I also brought turkey club with chips and a burger and fries. If you prefer a vegetarian option, I can go back and... Wordless, I grab the burger and take a big bite. I don't care what time it is. This is the best breakfast ever. I don't speak until I'm finished with it, too famished for proper etiquette. Thank you. I'm Ruby, she says. From the billboard, I say. Ruby nods. I also brought coffee, diet soda, and sweet tea. And I'm trying out a fancy-ass coffee thing, if you let me know what you think. I haven't had a sweet coffee drink in years, not since before I met Roy, but it's glorious. So good. She looks pleased and curious. That's when I realize I haven't told her my name. Oh, my God, I'm so rude. My name's Juniper. Oh, I know, she says with a knowing smile. I'm sure the whole town knows by now. I shoot her a queer look. The whole town? How? Rex is the mayor, sort of. He texted me this food order and then called Sheriff Mooney. The whole town is jibber-jabbering about a black caddy with a flame job possibly causing problems. Don't you worry, sister. You can stay here as long as you want to. I gape at her and wonder aloud, what the hell kind of place did I just break down in? Chapter 6, Rex. A week? I have to stay here for a week? I've just broken the news to her. The part I need to fix up her car has to be shipped here from another state. And there's a shortage of car part delivery drivers. I don't suppose ordering online would be any faster? She says with a hollow, despairing sound in her voice. Her belly full, that wild look in her eye has calmed a bit. When I shake my head, she glances out the window toward Ruby's parking lot next door. Maybe somebody has a room to rent? Someone does. Yeah, real cheap. I'll drive you there. I'm relieved she doesn't question the fact that I've already taken the liberty of removing her belongings from her car and stowing them in the truck. We drive through bustling downtown fate, past the cemetery, around the courthouse square, past the closed textile mill and arrive at my house. The three-story Victorian has seen better days, but the town bylaws dictate that the mayor has to live in what has historically been known as the mayor's residence. Owned by the town, it's a three-story money pit. 
As we pull into the driveway, Juniper's eyes light up the way they did when she met Ruby. This town has a bed and breakfast? I'm impressed. Nope, the mayor's residence. I grab her bags, and Flesh follows me up the stairs to the wraparound porch. Excuse me, she says, following me. But aren't you the mayor? I turn around to make a second trip for the rest of her things. Not exactly. Flash is the mayor, so I have to live where he lives to carry out mayoral duties that he cannot. And as the default mayor, I'm obligated to show hospitality to our town's visitors. She laughs as I continue to unpack my truck. Flash trots to his favorite spot on the porch, spreads out, watching the scene between Juniper and I unfold. Is that a problem? I could tell her about the bungalow just one street over. But I'm a low-down, dirty dog, and I don't. I want her to stay close. I don't want to inconvenience you, she says. As I close in on her, the 150-year-old porch creaks under my boots. If I know anything about men in general, I know that guy is going to come back looking for you. And when he does, he's going to have to come through me. Her voice drops. You, you don't even know why he's looking for me. I could be a fugitive. I turn and look at Flash. Flash, do we care why someone is looking for Miss Juniper? Upon hearing his name, Flash's big amber head lifts off the patio sofa. Seeing I'm not offering treats, he goes back to nuzzling the cushions. Flash, is this nice lady in imposition? The mayor makes a snuffling, sighing noise. I turn back to Juniper and see her smiling. It does my soul good to see her smile. Any more questions for the mayor before he's off to dreamland? Juniper smirks. Just one more. Where's the shower? Welcome back. Hi, lady listeners. So, like I said, all her good stuff that I talked about before will be in the show notes. Mel's going to add everything to it. So, sorry, Mel. You got a lot to add. <laughs> There's lots of good stuff. I already did a there. bunch of them already. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So, we'll see you back here on Thursday for the second installment of Roadside Attraction. That's it. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye. Bye, guys. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine, or you could sit back, relax, and unwind and read me romance. Read, read me romance.